Welcome, everybody, to this fun new panel. I'm so excited that Eric and John asked me to do this panel this year. We're calling this format the Fishbowl Panel. It's on the future of HPC and AI. My name is Addison Snell. I'm with Intersect 360 Research. I love coming to ISC. I love moderating panels like this. I love talking about the future of HPC and AI, and I like doing things that are innovative. And I like talking to lots of people while I'm here at ISC. So our idea for a new panel was that I will get to moderate a panel of three panelists. You can count them over there, one, two, three. Um, and, and what we're going to do to hear from more people, you know that feeling when you watch a panel and you're kind of sitting on the edge of your seat because you really want to say something and be the person up on the stage? Now's your chance. The format here today is that um, I'm going to be moderating this panel, but every eight minutes or so, I'm going to dismiss a panelist and we'll take a new one from the audience. <laughs> so if you are that person and you want to get up on stage, try checking in with John. John Schaff here, um, who's been helping run all of this whole show, is going to help me just get the next panelist up on the stage. When you come up, please introduce yourself your name, title, where you work, and you generally your area of responsibility. And if you're not one of the first panelists up, please be prepared to start by amplifying or disagreeing with something that you've already heard that will help the conversation uh, get going. And be ready to answer whatever question happens to come up on the future of HPC and AI. And we're going to have fun. Um, Sumir, why don't you start coming up, but our first three panelists, we had two that we already had ready to go based on the work that they're already doing at ISC. We already heard from Dan Reed, who's a presidential professor at University of Utah, who gave our opening keynote on reinventing high-performance computing, which I thought was an excellent topic to at least get us started. And we've also got Estela Suarez, who's a senior scientist and deputy lead at the technology department at Ulich Supercomputing Center, who is going to be part of the closing keynote later today, 5.45 to 6.30, Hall Z on upstairs on the third floor on HPC achievement and impact, past and future. So we wanted to start with them and their topics to kind of get us started. We're also joined with one more. Can you introduce yourself? <laughs> Maybe. Hi. My name is Samir Shende, and I'm a research professor and the director of the Performance Research Laboratory at the University of Oregon. I serve as the PI for the SDK project on programming models and runtime for the US Department of Energy's Exascale Computing Project. And I work on two projects, the Tau Performance System, a profiling and tracing toolkit that can show you where your application spends its resources and can be optimized. And the second is the extreme scale scientific software stack, or E4S, which is one of the main contributions of the Exascale Computing Project, a complete stack of uh, over 100 HPC and AI ML products, all packaged together for deployment to simplify the installation of many of our tools, which have become increasingly complex. So That's with perfect. That. You're welcome to the panel, and we look forward to hearing your views. Here's what we're going to start with. Dan, I loved your opening keynote, and one of the things I loved about it was really underscoring the influence that hyperscale companies are having across HPC, AI, and enterprise computing in general. The starting topic I want to introduce for the panel is, how is designing for hyperscale different than, or the same as, but different than designing for HPC? And as a result, how does HPC benefit and how does it suffer from all of the attention going to hyperscale? Dan, why don't you kick us off and then we'll see what the other panelists have to say. So I would say the high level answer to that question is, scale and our different valuations of money. So I was hired by Microsoft 20 years ago to take some ideas about HPC into the cloud space, and that was what the Extreme Computing Group uh, really worked on. But the first thing I realized when I went to Microsoft was I thought I was a big iron guy, and I realized, no, I was a small iron guy. I was a fast iron guy at the time, but the scale was vastly different, and the delta has simply accelerated since then. The speed and scale at which hyperscalers are building infrastructure 
in a month dwarfs what we might do in multiple years. And that effect means their influence on the technology, as I said yesterday, is about follow the money. So the big difference, I would say, in national labs around the world, uh, government and academia, is we live in a world where capital is really expensive and labor is relatively cheap. In the commercial hyperscale world, it's just the other way around. Capital is dirt cheap, and there's an enormous amounts of it, but labor is expensive. And, and this so is where it's going to be great to get to the supercomputing yeah. centers to your right, because as you see all this uh, d development design for hyperscale, how is that helping you and how is it hurting you? Go ahead, Estella. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that we need to profit, uh, so to understand what we can learn from the hyperscalers. There are many tools, many software developments, like containers, like all the software in, uh, stack that is built on top of those machines and makes them very flexible to use. But what you were saying on your keynote, there is the danger that uh, they are starting developing their own hardware. We don't have access to that hardware. At some point, we have to find what is the benefit for both sides to collaborate with each other. So for us, we can benefit from many tools. They can benefit also from some of the techniques that we are using. But is this enough to motivate them to play with us with less money? That's a good point. Samir, your thoughts? So hyperscalers bring some unique strengths with them. But there are also some pitfalls. We are used to the HPC ecosystem, where things are set up just right for us. And often when people try to make that jump to these hyperscalers, they find that there are different network adapters, for instance, like EFA, Elastic Fabric Adapter for AWS. They, the GPUs they are interested in, you know, with the GFX 90A, for example, AMD architecture, those are missing in the hyperscalers and they don't have the resources to get these niche products, so to say, on their systems. The operating systems that we are used to are finely tuned to massive on-node parallelism. That's not the case for the default operating systems that you may find on the hyperscaler. So there's just a bridge. For example, we live in an MPI-centric world. Okay, we expect that on the same node we'll have the XP mem module loaded in the kernel so that this fast, efficient transfer between messages on the so same node, you will find it very hard to find an instance in the hyperscalers where they have all of those drivers optimized for MPI and available. So the E4S project is addressing that gap and we are building infrastructure to help with the hyperscaler deployment as well. But Dan, until the, we get Dan, those the GPUs, moment he said hyperscalers don't have the resources, you picked up your microphone. Yeah. Well, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so what I was going to say is I don't disagree with anything that Samir said technically, but I will say this, and I tried gently to say it on Monday. We're locked into a software worldview. We're also a small entity in our software base and the number of developers for our software base. There's a whole software ecosystem that is evolving at light speed in the hyperscalers that supports most of the rest of the world. All right, now re reply though to the other thing that they both said about what hyperscalers need to learn from HPC. Do you think that part is true? Yeah, I do, and some things have been learned. So if you think about when MapReduce first appeared, it was, uh, by HPC standards, a fairly crude approach to doing bulk synchronous parallel computation. Low latency communication, faster VMs, communication offload, those are things that we actually knew how to do. So there has been some cross-fertilization, and the fact that VMs uh, in the hyperscalers run with almost the same low latency communication that we deliver in HPC world is an example of convergence. All right, Estelle and Sumir go the other way now in terms of what HPC should be learning from hyperscale. And don't say AI, that's a cheap and easy one. Pick <laughs> something else. Well, but the, maybe I would say the flexibility on the use of the resources, the flexibility on to allocate resources to different users, to share those resources between different ah. users. So we are in a relatively static way of allocating resources in HPC with schedulers that just give a bunch of nodes to some users and then when they are done, it's, it's ready. But the applications themselves are evolving towards workflows that are not always active on the same kind of resources and we need to be able to release, to take, them, to take more of them in a more flexible and dynamic manner. And I okay. think that 
That's a good one, Samir. So I would like the hyperscalers to address the kinds of supercomputers we already have and provide environments and hardware that resembles that, including the GPUs that we need from Intel, from AMD, and they're not doing a good job with that at all. I think Dan specifically said that's not going to happen, though, that, that the, the bespoke infrastructure designed by Hyperscale is not for sale. The services built on it is what's for sale. Dan, did I get that right? You did. And so that's, again, where the money is, and it goes to the leverage, as Estella said. What do we bring to the table that will make them interested in partnering with us? It's not money. We don't yes. have enough. It has to be a leverage in an ecosystem that opens new markets to them. That's what's going to drive partnerships. So that means we in the HPC world have to think expansively about applications that aren't just what I would say scientific curiosity, but have societal or economic benefits. Those are the ones that create embrace and expansion. All right, let me get one closing thought from you then before I get rid of you. Uh, the, because the hyperscale, this I can't think of it. It's rare in human history that so much power and influence has been concentrated into so few companies. I think it has not happened before in the technology era. I don't think it's happened at this level since the late industrial revolution. Is this long term stable or is something going to break this up? Something always breaks it up. There was a time when uh, one or two oil companies dominated the world market, and their market capitalization in current dollars would probably be comparable to some of those, those companies. The, the lesson I would say, you know, the late Andy Grove is famously quoted as saying, only the paranoid survive, but that's not the key message of what he said. What he really said was, success breeds complacency. Complacency breeds defeat. Mm -hmm. And then he said, only the paranoid survive. So <laughs> what survives are people who constantly innovate and ask themselves, if I were going to put me out of business, what would I do? I better go do that first. Success is a horrible teacher. All right. Thank you, Dan. You get down. <laughs> you. Please come up and introduce yourself. Hello? Name what you do. Area of responsibility. Uh, this is Dida Munat from Koch University. I'm a faculty there, and I'm doing HPC. <laughs> All right, very good. Now, amplify or disagree with something that you've already heard. Um, maybe I can amplify what uh, we can teach or hyperscale. So um, I think uh, sparsification now is very, like ah. sparse computation is very important. It's becoming more popular in deep learning especially. And we know uh, sparse computation very well in HP. So we have been doing this for 30 years. Uh, we know graph algorithms. We know graph partitioning. We know how to optimize them. So we can uh, probably teach them how to do uh, optimization. But what we can learn or maybe benefit from them is if they uh, go after sparsification, they can develop the hardware that will work well for sparse computation. So everyone knows Jack Dangara's talk about you know, HPCG uh, benchmark that we get only 3% maximum on uh, type 500 systems for sparse computation. But if we design the uh, sparse computation specific hardware that is coming from the AI world, then we will benefit from I, it. I like that answer, and we haven't heard enough about sparse computation, particularly in the context of hyperscale. We don't have a hyperscaler up there right now to respond, so I'm going to put that in my pocket. A big topic this week has been talking about sustainability. This has been huge in our research, other areas. Estella, I know you're going to talk about it later as part of your keynote. I will give you a stat right now that half of HPC users in our surveys are saying they're making compromises in their system configurations in order to accommodate power, cooling, other facilities. They're not buying what they would otherwise want in order to accommodate the, the facilities constraints. That's what I want to ask about is these trade-offs versus performance. How is sustainability altering the course of HPC and AI development, Estella? Yeah, well, one thing that we have learned in the last year since the energy cost increased in dramatically since the, the war in Ukraine is that we actually can do things to improve the energy efficiency. So the computer centers you have seen talks in this conference uh, these days are really making actions to reduce the, pow the, the, the power consumption. However, I think that the 
it is uh, still a lot of work to do to understand this interrelation with performance in a quantitative manner. So our systems are extremely complex, our applications are extremely complex, and it's very difficult to predict if I change a small parameter there, what is the consequence on the whole thing? And I think that there is where we really need to work a lot on. All right, Samir. I, I agree with uh, what you said. And you know, sustainability is such an important issue. Uh, extracting the most performance from these systems at the same energy level remains a critical issue. And whether we are talking about hyperscalers or on-prem clusters, we need to first make sure that we start with the configuration with operating systems that are optimized for that performance with libraries that we build our whole software ecosystem on that are optimized to use the resources efficiently. When you are sending messages from a GPU to another GPU, your MPI should be GPU aware, for instance. Then you can build all the other layers on top of that to observe the, the better performance. And you need tools to be able to observe and characterize the performance that you are getting and reason about them to see the performance at different layers of the software stack and say, am I getting what I expect to get? That is a fantastic point. I'm going to come back to Estella on it in just a second, but let me hear from Didem first on, on uh, just how sustainability is affecting the future of HPC and AI. Um, I agree both uh, panelists, and um, I think uh, maybe we should ask also users um, whether they are willing to sacrifice some performance um, so that they can get better sustainability. And I was uh, at a panel um, half an hour ago uh, about uh, performance portability. I think it goes along with sustainability, goes with performance portability. Uh, so do you want more portable and sustainable code or do you, uh, do you opt for more performance? And I think in the future, if and when we have my, much more diverse architectures, maybe we will, um, users will be willing to you know, go for uh, sustainable and portable code rather than uh, performance. All right, uh, Stella, I really like what they're both talking about, but as we talk about then, performance per watt or flops per watt, do we need to get more intelligent than that in terms of what the performance metric is and what we're getting out of the power that gets consumed by the system? I, I don't think it's about the metric itself. It's about understanding what does have a strong impact on that metric. And there are many factors. So it's the different kinds of res or hardware resources that you are using, how much data movement you are doing across the system, what kind of data layout you have. So it's not only, it's on the application, it's on the software stack, it's on the hardware infrastructure, it's also even on the data center. All these things have, we have tons of data collected on the different monitoring systems for the different aspects. We need to correlate all that data to understand at the end on the number you were asking, so flop per watt, what is really the factors where we can play around, where we can make improvements. All right, you're done. Get off the stage, Estella. <laughs> Please come up and uh, be ready to introduce yourself, where you're from, and uh, disagree with something you've already heard. <laughs> uh, right, so I'm Marek. I am currently an HPC manager at the Faculty of Mathematics of Cambridge University in the UK. So just to give some people a bit of context, this is a place where Stephen Hawking used to work before he passed away. And uh, so just to give you an idea what kind of computing work we can do. Uh, so yeah, I'm a particle physicist by training and uh, fascination, and if you look at my career path, it's something between a system, a system a architect and data engineer. So I have got quite a big data focus in what I used to do. All right, this is actually setting up well then, because I want to build on where we were just going in terms of how we even talk about performance in this space. You know, I used to know what a flop was. And it seems like even when we talk about a flop now, I got to go, wait a minute, what do you mean, right? With all the diversity in architectures and applications, how are we going to be measuring the performance of HPC and AI systems? And it's even important to be able to compare uh, performance across different architectures. Is comparability important? 
Mm, oh, I think compatibility. Welcome to the stage, Mark. You have to answer a question now. <laughs> so I think, I think comparability is very important. I mean, as a scientist uh, from a fairly quantitative field that particle physics is, even though it's mostly about approximations and models in practice, we do insist, in theory at least, on having reproducibility. And being able to actually compare your results is an important part of rep reproducibility. And at the same time, we already know, at least I expect a lot of people in the room know, that uh, a large number of scientific papers uh, that are currently published, when people try to reproduce them, they haven't actually been able to. So the people have been using the phrase uh, reproducibility crisis. I'm not sure if it's actually that far, but it is definitely something we need to keep in mind. And as systems grow more and more complex, uh, just to give it closer to home, and you might as well have seen a lot of those GPU benchmarks that gaming websites post. You see, it's really hard to compare GPUs these days because you can see you get a massive bar difference in this direction for this benchmark, completely the opposite way in the other one. So I think we are getting to the point where you, you, you're starting to need to get a data, to get the PhD in data science to start to understand those benchmarks. Okay, I'm exaggerating, but we're not that far. So. Yeah, reproducibility, I think, is an important aspect of it. Come back to, to DDM. What do you think on it, you know the different metrics of performance? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we we are used to uh, reporting flops, but what matters is you know memory uh, operations per second, or for some applications, it's uh, particles per cell or truth put uh, per second or so d depending on the application it's very different and there's mixed precision so when you talk about flops how do you count you know um, uh, is it double precision single precision or half precision uh, so absolutely true Valentina Salapura gave a great keynote at the end of the day yesterday and she was talking about the the uh, language processing model that had consumed 2.5 yada flops of aggregate performance but I mean I didn't know, I guess that was tensor flops. I don't know, and I don't even know how to, you yeah. know, bring yeah. that back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so um, another, um, I think, issue is, um, you know, benchmarking. How do you do the benchmarking? So what is your setup? And I think Torsten Hofler has a very nice article on this, how to do measurements uh, for AI community, because we know how to do measurements in HPC, but it's a must read for any graduate student who starts in my group, for example because um, how you do the benchmark, how you report the performance is very important if you especially compare with other uh, frameworks. And All right, Samir, what do you think about how we're measuring performance? So there are tools out there that we should leverage because you actually need to measure those flops. There are tools like PAPI from ICL, University of Tennessee, Knoxville in the US, and Liquid from FAU in Germany that do a good job in mapping the native counters that the processor provides back to the higher level events, including floating point operations that are executed. So it's important to actually measure what your code is doing. Now, as far as uh, uh, the definition of flops is concerned, there is uh, much debate in that area, and I don't want to get into that right here. But the second part of your question about reproducibility of results, well, we can learn a lot about this from using containers and nailing down the dependencies, nailing down the versions of your software and providing a container can go a long way in addressing that issue of reproducibility of scientific results. And uh, I encourage people to take a snapshot in the form of a container when they publish a paper and make that container available publicly through sites like you know, Docker Hub. I think it's a great point, and to be fair, I said comparability. It was Marek who uh, expanded it to reproducibility, with I, which I think was very smart. But I'm gonna stick with the containers for a second because if, even if I put it in a container, if I really change the underlying processing elements and architectures, am I still going to get even comparability, let alone reproducibility? So I think you can get reasonable reproducibility with containers. Now, the architecture on which you deploy the container can make a big difference because you may have different network interfaces on the target system that can be maybe different. Darn right you can, yeah. Yeah, maybe different from the one that you actually ran the original <coughs> container on, assuming that we are talking about a multi-node configuration which includes network interfaces and such. But at least you avoid the problems associated with starting from a scratch 
and trying to download tarballs and compiling those to reach a point where you are at least attempting to create an experiment that tries to reproduce the original scientific results. All right, Marek, you've heard both of them respond to what you said. Get in there again. What yeah, do you so say? I might actually add that this is something that, at least in the particle physics community, at least in the heavy ion physics at CERN, has been something on our mind for quite a long time. But even when I worked as a po my first postdoc in an A61 experiment, we actually had a pretty big point specifically about software preservation. This was in part because an A61 actually in inherited software from its predecessor, hardware predecessor, an A49, and that was software written in late 1980s, early 1990s very strictly performance optimized, meaning a lot of very impressive and uh, read ugly hacks in the C code. And actually even getting it to run again was a serious challenge. And might, I might add that in our case, we actually opted for, I think it was at least for a time, the general CERN approach to opt for virtual machines rather than containers because we really needed to try to lock everything down as, pos as much as possible because even when we got the system upgrade on the CERN batch system, we would end up seeing dif differences in the computation, out of the computations would be comparable with the effects we observe. And we would spend like a year or a year and a half trying to attribute whether we actually change something in the measurement proper or is it just a floating point artifact or whatever. And I might also add that this actually applies to quite a lot of things that were said earlier, but to this in particular, and since this is close to my heart, this is something I think we should actually look uh, to ourselves to solve, or at least address, and not to expect hyperscalers to solve for us. Ah, because good frankly point. speaking, my experience, uh, because my other hat is actually that I'm a gentle Linux developer. And my experience of maintaining the software ecosystem for Linux distribution is that many hyperscalers has a bit of a, how to put it politely, short attention spans to the things that they release to the public. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so yeah. We okay. actually need to, uh, if we actually want to keep things stable, I don't think this is the direction where we want to so get ins inspiration Samir, from. Samir, you picked up your microphone and you were nodding along. Do you agree with what he just said? So I, I think the points he made uh, <coughs> with the use of virtual machines is a good first step, absolutely. I, I completely agree but that- But there's more? Uh, it's, it's a little better with containers just because you don't have the overhead of two operating system kernels. All right, you talked about it's containers before, you're done. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Samir. Thank you for being the first to volunteer. Okay, next up. Now I gotta deal with a guy with an accent. <laughs> Please introduce yourself, where you're from, and uh, what, what kind of, and disagree with something that already came up. Um. I'm Fabrizio Magogliani with uh, uh, E4 Computer Engineering. Uh, we are a system integrator and a technology provider. Uh, my background is basic uh, uh, HPC. I was uh, with uh, Edison back in the good old times of SGI. We started from there and we are here together. Um, <laughs> and good times. All right, what do you disagree with that you already heard? Uh, I think that there was a lot of discussion about how to measure flops. but. Is this a discussion which uh, is all interesting for this community? The user don't really get interested in what uh, you measure, flops, they want results. Ah, that is a very good point. And uh, you know, we ought to pivot off of processing. I have a list of topics in front of me and I'm kind of freewheeling wheeling a bit depending on where we're going. And I think what I want to ask next is, we've been talking so much about processing as the element there. It's very processor element focused. How do data storage movement and management technologies and strategies, the data side, how does that have to evolve in order to support the future of HPC and AI, Fabrizio? I think that we have to move uh, uh, computation close to the data. That's the only way I can see uh, we can uh, I'm going to double click on that before you even keep talking, because I know you, and I'm going to take advantage of it. I keep hearing move computation closer to the data, but no one is designing ambulatory processors that walk around. So be specific about what you mean there. You are short-sighted, Addison. Ah. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> We have to imagine, we have to build uh, a world when this is going to be possible, okay? And it, it is in the hands of this community, start dreaming what may be brought to the end 
part of the data. And they are at that point we will have data and computation together and we use only our best HPC system for predicting what is the future. Okay, Didem. Yeah, so um, I want to do some research in processing in memory and then I search online what is available uh, to do research and I found one and then I sent an email asking like, can we use your technology? And then they said, yeah, you can use it. Uh, it's in the cloud, $50 an hour. And this is educational price. It's like $50 an hour for using their technology. It's a bit too high for, you know, faculty. Um, but I, I'm really interested in using processing in memory. If, those, if their technology is available, they should make it, um, available for researchers to experiment and show, you know, scientific workload can work on these architectures and uh, we can publish papers and then we can, you know, use them in our workloads. So uh, this is, you know, open call. If you are developing such technology, we will be interested in experimenting and uh, porting some applications to that. Marek, how b has the data side have to evolve? Right, so <laughs> I started uh, smiling as soon as Fabrizio mentioned the moving compute closer to the data because uh, I think I heard first hear that phrase literally 10 years ago at one of the high energy physics meetings. And uh, this is on one hand encouraging that it seems that we, meaning HEP, have actually been quite visionary in terms of big data processing, but at the same time, seeing somebody is really bad at communicating around here. Because uh, if uh, this is something that's only recently being discussed in more seriously in HPC, that means what were we in high energy physics doing, not telling people about this? Because there is this thing called the grid, which is like a very crude version of the cloud, which is used for processing LHC primarily data. And it is distributed across a lot of different sites across Europe and uh, the US. Not sure if we've got anything else outside. And in a way, it's been going strong. It's still being used, and it is, in fact, designed in such a way that... All right, I'm going to stop this answer here, and here's why. Because I asked about how the data side has to evolve, and all three of you talked about processing. So okay. start again, come back to DDIM, and talk to me about storage and networking. Okay, right. All, no, start with DDIM here, and try again on the same question, and don't talk about processing. Okay. Go. <laughs> so can you ask the question again? <laughs> <laughs> How do data? Like how does the, how does data management, data movement, data process? Not processing. I said processing. <laughs> how do, how does data storage, movement, and management technologies and strategies have to evolve to support the future of HPC and AI? Okay. No one can talk about storage. <laughs> okay. I uh, stumped them. <laughs> I've got something to say, but no. All right, go ahead, Marek, if you're ready. Yeah. Right, so that will be as it for like another project on which I worked for in high energy physics. So th right now we are very much aware that uh, we are getting to the point where we really need to access our data in other different ways than before. And there's various ideas like the Data Lake project of the big EU initiative called Escape for more general EOSC for doing or unifying data access. And part of it have actually been quite interesting ideas about essentially making your whole data store roughly transparent, for instance, using by using consistent hashing, not to just distribute data across like a cluster in Here we uh, go. Okay. recording, but actually to make it distributed across different sites. And uh, of course that requires fast network connections, but luck luckily we are getting to the point where we actually got network connections which are handled to are able to handle a fairly decent amounts of data. Of course, not like the top end of the scale. For that you still need local fast interconnect, but uh, Local network connections are getting more and more capable, and in the end, this kind of approach where, <laughs> in a way, you could actually imagine that, that I wouldn't say they completely got divorced, but you kind of start having data and the compute getting kind of orthogonal. In the okay, sense Fabrizio, that you go next. Uh, I frankly disagree, okay? Good. Uh, <laughs> let's make it a, a bit brilliant. Uh, you will never have enough bandwidth, uh, whatever tools we are using network to feed the, the beast that we are building, okay? So if uh, the problem is that Addison is uh, tricking us uh, in answering a new way to an old question, okay? So the, the real fact that we should say, Addison, uh, you're asking the wrong question to yourself and to us. Let's try the other way. Storage is just a, a minor part uh, 
because all the data is going to be elaborated uh, at the edge and use only the big beast uh, to do whatever they are good at, which is not using uh, the, the small data. So when Addison is telling ah, how, how storage will evolve, uh, we will have petabyte uh, in your mobile. Okay, did yeah, I? I, I thought the latency is the, the, the biggest problem, not the bandwidth, maybe I'm wrong, but um, so the um, technologies needs to address the network latency. Bandwidth we can maybe get, it's more, I'm more optimistic about the bandwidth, but not the latency. We can have optical networks, right? So uh, we will be limited by the latency. So they, the, the new technologies need to address the latency. Okay, Didim, yeah. thank you very much. You're done. <laughs> we'll get a new panelist in here while he walks. Is this fun or not? <laughs> I'm having a good time. <laughs> Please come up, introduce yourself, and disagree with something. <laughs> and with that introduction, thanks, John. Um, hi, my name is Nick Wright. I am the chief architect at NERSC at Berkeley Lab. Um, and what do I want to disagree with? Um, let me see here. So the last thing about data. Um, so, you know, I've, in my job many, many years, I have been in many, many vendor briefings. And so the first guy that comes in talks about the processor, and he takes an hour. Second guy comes in, talks about the memory and the network, and maybe that's another hour. And then you're out of time, and the storage guy goes, have I got any time left to talk? And they're like, no, just buy some storage. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and <laughs> that right. is kind of reflective of your question, right? Nobody pays much attention to it. There's not very much investment in it. There is an IO500, but it's not very high profile. And so until you start changing the conversation and asking different questions and having metrics that actually reflect. Let's go what the to this then. Are. Since since Fabrizio evoked edge, uh, we hear edge to core to cloud, people talk about that. I want to talk about the cloud portion. 5 to 10 years out for the average HPC user, what proportion of the budget is going to be on-prem versus cloud? Uh, it, does it hit some kind of limit? Where does it go? Average HPC user on-prem versus cloud, what's the proportion of budget? It, it, it depends on the data, right? Data has mass. So you can't just move to the cloud one day and move back again. All right, does any of you think it's going to be 100% cloud? Does any of that you think it's going to be 0% cloud? That was cloud? a long-winded way of saying All right, no. so somewhere between 0 and 100, where do you think cloud's going to be? Anyone want to take it first? Addison, why? You ask him that. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you why, because we put out a forecast, so we say what we think it is, and then everyone comes at us saying, no, 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 you're wrong. It's too high, it's too low, it's too whatever. And I want to ask other people, what do you think? Because I learned from this. Addison, if you're asking me, I have a reply. If you're asking Mark, it's another and the other. So That's I'll the I'll point. We can disagree. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, someone yeah. give me a number, though. Each of us will have a number. The, the, the sum of the, um, the number does not average. Uh, that's the difference. Right, so for different use cases, it, it will be very different. <laughs> right. So Yeah, you can welcome to the world of how hard it is to be an analyst. We're going to pass on this question. No one wants to do that. <laughs> All right, in that case, I'm going to play a different game. I've got a list of terms here that we hear about at conferences like this or various marketing presentations. I want you to give me speed answers. Is what I'm talking about here overrated or underrated? You can you know, respond if you like, but what I want to know is, do you think this is overrated or underrated? We're going to start with, I'll pick one, composability, overrated or underrated? It brings a lot of hopes. <laughs> All right. It's a lot of hopes. Is it overrated or underrated right now? Uh, neutral. Neutral? What does any of the rest of you think? Marek? Actually, I'll say it is roughly, I agree. That it seems this is something Nude. I think it's getting for the early we're certainly getting in there right Nick, now. But overrated or underrated on composability yeah. right now? Are you buying or selling? Waiting. Waiting, okay. <laughs> Let's try a different one. DPUs, overrated or underrated? Uh, necessary. Necessary, okay. <laughs> Mark, I think I'll go with overrated. Overrated on DPUs, Nick? 
Uh, it depends on the use case. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Containers, overrated or underrated? Nick, start. Oh, over by way, way, way Containers over. Containers yeah. are overrated. Mark, overrated uh, or underrated? I think it's getting better, but still a bit overrated. Overrated. Fabrizio, overrated or underrated? Uh, underrated. Underrated. The idea of edge decor to cloud, is this overrated or underrated, Fabrizio? Uh, underrated. Underrated. Marek? Mm. Yeah, I'll go with underrated. Underrated. You like the idea. Nick, overrated or underrated? i got to be contrary. I'll say overrated. Overrated. See how much fun this is? 64-bit precision. Is that overrated or underrated? Necessary. All right, you need it. Okay, question is what do you actually mean the precision or do you mean how much we talk about it? <laughs> I mean the actual use of 64-bit computation, 64-bit precision. Is that overrated or underrated for this conference? Uh, underrated. Underrated. You think it's important, Nick? I don't care. <laughs> Point all the Nick, way. what did you think we were going to do up here? <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were trying to entertain the audience, but you can do whatever <laughs> it is you want to do. X86 architectures, overrated or underrated? Oh, uh, it doesn't matter anymore, really. Over. All right, Mark? I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon, so underrated. Underrated, Fabrizio? Good for something, bad for something else. I'm going to try one more of these, even though you aren't playing. How important is application portability across different architectures? Is, that, is application portability overrated or underrated? Necessary. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to the microphone. You, you put the two choices. I want three. <laughs> OK, fine. Nick? Yeah, it, uh, it depends. It depends. It, it depends. Well, yeah, it, it depends on the resources of the team writing the application. Is the is the long answer right? If you have resources to port it, then uh, portability is an easy problem to solve. If you don't, then you uh, program to the lowest common denominator, which is a much more boring answer. But you wanted boring answers that are correct, I guess. So, I want. Yeah, that's what I've been going for: is boring answers. Yeah. I, I really spent a lot of time planning. Uh, to try to get to the boringest answers I could. <laughs> All right, Marek, what last words do you have before I get rid of you? Yep, uh, well, so this is largely through my open source slash Linux developer hat, but, uh, and a bit of my pet peeve, but very much underrated. Okay. It's a very important topic that will, also related to vendor locking. Uh, I'm not going to talk more about how that. I'll let you have the last word then on how important is open source in general. Uh, oh, it is very much important. All right, well, thank you for playing on the panel. I, I can see Laura over there looking very keen to stand up. <laughs> no one wants to go next. While we wait for the next volunteer, open source, overrated or underrated from the other two of you. <laughs> Please come up, introduce yourself, and disagree with something. Hi, so I'm Michelle Wieland. I'm a professor and director of research at EPCC, the supercomputing center at the University of Edinburgh. I told myself I wasn't going to do this, but, <laughs> but I am. Um, I want to disagree with something from way back, actually, to start, and that is the... That's fine. Um, in order to be sustainable, users might have to accept performance reduction. I completely disagree with that. Um, once we've bought a machine, once we've installed it, we should push for the highest performance for the users because the science is what we buy these machines for. We don't just, you know, we don't do crypto mining. So um, the infrastructure around needs to be optimized, but users should never compromise on performance. I like that point. Welcome to the stage. This is going to be a lot of fun. All right, John, since you were just pushing a pitch to get more diversity up on stage, I'm going to pivot and go to a, a, a more general topic because no one liked the last one. 
what can our industry do to attract more talent, particularly young talent and diverse talent, in order to protect our industry? I think this is the most important topic for the long-term health of our industry up here. What should we be doing that we're not doing? Michelle, you're welcome to the stage. You go first. Oh, dear. I know, that's a hard one. Um, I, I don't know. I think catch them young, make it exciting. I mean, to me... It's a, it's a no-brainer being in HPC. It's exciting from a technology point of view, from a challenge point of view, from an impact point of view. The people that aren't excited about it, I find, find a bit odd. Um, I'm with you. <laughs> so what can we do to make it attractive for, to, to young people? Just show them how exciting it is, what you can do with all the technology, all the problem solving. Yes, it's hard, but something that is hard to solve, that is, that is surely the fun of it. So getting into schools, showing ex how exciting it is and what the impact can be, I think that's the only way forward. Fabrizio. I respectfully disagree, okay? Yes. Uh, it's a matter of, it's a, it's a dirty matter of money, okay? The HPC is not paying much. If you go to banking... Uh, it depends. Uh, well, yeah, but you know, a guy paying uh, a lot of money for uh, doing uh, games, just to make a name, won't ever come to HPC. So they have to cope the paying. Sure, I mean, I think you can tie it back to the first question today, though, and what Dan talked about uh, the other uh, day, which is that um, if you have the convergence between uh, people doing cloud computing and, and hyperscalers and the kind of technologies they're deploying and the way they're using the machines and what HPC does, then the difference between the career paths are not that different. And hopefully there is a lot more cross-pollination. The second thing that I would say is that every now and then John and I and others go down to campus in Berkeley it's not that easy to persuade the grad students that they should come up and use the supercomputer. They're not that interested, right? And so, Why not? Well, because of the reasons I'm just talking about, right? You, you say to them, you have to use MPI, and they're like, oh my god, this is assembly programming for communication, right? They, they, they hate it. But that's it. the fun. It's hard. Right? Yeah, we got to get back to Michelle on this. And everyone disagreed with you. Get in there, Michelle. <laughs> well, well that, that is the, the excitement. I mean, I don't want to click a button to do something. I want to solve the problem. I want to think about it and, and solve a hard problem. And, and surely clever grad students want to solve problems. I mean, if they're just going... Everything is automated, click of a button, things are deployed. Who cares? I mean, that's boring. <laughs> well, but uh, <laughs> They don't even need me anymore. Keep going. So, 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 so do you have a Linux running on your phone? Uh, no, but I don't do signs on my phone. Uh, no, no, but that's the <laughs> I read Twitter on my phone. Yeah, but that's, that's, that, that's my point, right? The, why, why are you uh, introducing these artificial barriers to entry, right? If you want to bring in more diverse groups, people from less traditional educational backgrounds, coming in and saying to them, this is a really hard thing, it's not a great sales pitch. But that's implying that if you come from a less traditional background, you don't enjoy hard problems. That's a little bit... Um, that's like saying women don't go into HPC because the problems are too hard to solve. <laughs> oh, careful. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not what I said. I'm just entertaining the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fabrizio, is it, if we just pay them more, will the women oh, come? Uh, th that's my uh, final stuff. Uh, the fact that we are trying to attract the talents uh, based on what we, which are old guys, quote unquote, all, all quote unquote, uh, old. have been attracted to. <laughs> so we should find new wave of attractive talents, uh, making them dreaming of what uh, technical scientific achievement they can do using HPC. The problem is that uh, we don't know, uh, we do, in Italy at least, uh, we don't have talents coming out of the university willing to work on MPI because they want to work on sixth generation language. I, I want to actually amplify on this point, and Nick, you started, are, I mean, are, are we heading for a crisis of lack of programmers for Fortran or C? We're not going to have them? For, for what? For? For? <laughs> for, for, for oh, for, yeah, because there's no Fortran out there. No, no, no of for, you for, have any. But, but for Fortran and C, yeah, right? I mean, if you go, there's a really uh, nice article out of Los Alamos a few weeks ago about the state of Fortran and the future of it, and, you know, it's kind of pessimistic. Um, there's yeah, a really great article in the New York Times a little while ago about COBOL programmers in banks, right? And there's this really famous guy who's like 89 years old. He gets a limo to work every day. He's the only one who knows exactly how the COBOL in the bank works, right? This stuff is, it, it's, it should go away. It will take it a shouldn't. long time to, but it should. 
Do you know that IBM was one of the biggest growers in the HPC AI market last year in our numbers specifically because of the introduction of a new Z series model that's targeting enterprise AI? Just a fun fact. Go ahead, Michelle. No, I, I, now we're going to the Fortran discussion. Fortran is great. If you can write Python, you can write Fortran, right? And it's, it's much easier than C, C++. The code doesn't look as horrible when it, somebody does C++ badly. You know, bad Fortran is 10 times better than bad C++. Listen to someone coming to bat for Fortran. I love it. Go ahead, Fabrizio. Uh, I will uncork uh, the bottle of the best Chianti when <laughs> Fortran is not going to be any more used, okay? Because it means that... Uh, all the language, all the programs. Are we recording this? We're not. OK, <laughs> go ahead. All the programs, all the application will move to a more consistent um, software environment. Uh, OK? Fortran has been born in the 60s. The, you remember Fortran age? OK. We are bringing a sort of zombie in, in, in our age. When was C born? All right, you C just dissed Fortran, yeah. Fabrizio. Get off the stage. <laughs> Please come up to the stage, introduce yourself, and disagree with something. Hi, Gary. <laughs> Hello, so I'm Sebastian Rumley. I'm uh, in a university in Switzerland. I used to work with John and in Colombia and know a couple of people. Uh, yeah, I tend to disagree with you with MPI, and I'm giving you perspective. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of things with data scientists these days. And they're all about Hadoop, Sparks, and stuff like that. I found one paper that shows that you can do the same thing with MPI than Spark, but you can, and with MPI, 10 times more efficient. So I keep showing these things to people and say, look, it's 10 times more efficient. And they, they just don't want to hear about it. Because it's, it's, it's like it's Fortran. It's like crazy stuff. I, I love this. I want yeah. to, we're going to stay with this topic. We're not done with it. Go ahead, Michelle. Right, but then if it's 10 times more efficient, it's also more sustainable, more power efficient, more energy efficient. So why? I know it's the easier tool for the job, right? And it's, it's, it's possibly a good tool for the job, but then maybe our duty is to make Spark as efficient as MPI is, as opposed to pushing people towards MPI. But the reason MPI is good is that it's efficient, and if you write your code well, you can get the best possible energy efficiency and the best possible time to solution. Using the simple tool, you know, if you run a lot of it, you're wasting a lot of CO2. Nick's been waiting to talk into that mic. He's got it poised. Go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think uh, at some level, though, performance can be somewhat overrated, right? The difference between 15 minutes and an hour is coffee and lunch. The difference between four hours and eight hours is still overnight. So many people just don't care. But they should, because the difference between 15 minutes and an hour is four times more energy. Oh, I, I, yes, but to that person, it's lunch or lunch. So it doesn't matter. Um, I, I would put it for the customer of this person, it can be 100 bucks per hour or more. And that's the reason why they don't do MPI. It's just because it takes a lot of time. And, and, and because yeah. kind of HPC is a con, sort of a niche where you have to probably well. like to bang yourself uh, the head on your walls uh, because it's hard and you like it. Right. I mean, I, I think Dan said at the beginning, right? Right. In HPC, the the uh, people are relatively cheap, right? And so, you know, they don't don't. They, so they will optimize for performance. If you're in the commercial world, they'll go. Yeah. Now wait a minute. People are relatively cheap, so it doesn't matter if they're four times less efficient. I'm going to go ahead and disagree with that. When I try to hire people. You know, making my people the most effective I possibly can with the best tools I can give them. I can tell you as a small business owner, that matters a great deal to me. And I'm not sure it doesn't still matter at large business. I just invited myself to my own panel. Michelle, go ahead. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, grad, grad student time is uh, anyway. But, but, uh -huh. but just because just because somebody's cheap, I mean, yeah, I, I I agree with that, Addison says. So just just because somebody doesn't cost so much to employ doesn't mean they should get away with. Oh, I just 
I'll just leave it running over lunchtime. They, they should always, the bigger picture should always be important. Sebastian, well, break the tie. Right, but the... Oh. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's like, it, it, okay, I'm going to slightly change subject. It's like JavaScript. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> look, look, look. So JavaScript is a disaster. We can, you can see it as a disaster because it's all uh, uh, hash maps. And, and yet, it's the second most used language after Python, which is even worse. And <laughs> so, yeah, and I guess that the reason is that the people can get more for the, uh, what matters is really money. For small project, it's really money. You need to deliver a solution in a couple of days. And you're not in a lab, national lab, very cozy. And then you go to the like, right. cheapest solution. Nick, I cut you off before. Go ahead. And then I'm going to amplify something Sebastian said before and kind of pivot a little bit. But Nick, what were you saying? I don't remember. Oh, you don't remember. OK, perfect. OK, so you came up, Sebastian. You were talking about how people know uh, Hadoop, or they were looking at analytics. Now we've been talking about machine learning. Can we make the case here for old school deterministic computing and where that belongs, right? What's the, you know, uh, what are the limitations of the analytics and machine learning? Where do we need to be doing deterministic computing for science? Can I skip this one? Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I, I'm asking a joker here. <laughs> uh, what, what was the joke? The joker. I, I don't know. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I mean, there's, so there's some really simple answers, right? Do you want your medical procedure decided by a deterministic one or a statistical process, right? Do you want your self-driving car? You know, there's many, many things in the world that you probably don't want to have a throws of the dice involved in. The, the self-driving car is done with the experiential model, not the deterministic one. How many actual real self-driving cars are there? There are plenty in Silicon Valley driving around. Actually, it's kind of freaky. <laughs> but things like building bridges, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, aircraft engines. That, that sort of stuff I'd quite like. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to not be done by guessing. Yeah. Um, other stuff, it probably doesn't matter so much because like, anything that uses ensembles, you probably can throw in a few non-deterministic uh, computations, average it out, and you'd still be fine. It's still going to rain tomorrow, so, um, but yeah. Sebastian? Uh, yeah, I, this, this deterministic against non-deterministic is, uh, <laughs> and I never really thought about it. I mean, I think if you can do MPI, if you can replace Spark by MPI, then it turns deterministic. I, I guess you could do, and yeah, I don't, I don't see a big, like, one side or another side on this. I'll make this a little more specific then. I kind of breezed past this in the overrated, underrated thing, but we talked about 64-bit precision. I think this is one of the important discussions that's come to HPC as a result of AI as we're talking about where is it actually efficacious to do expensive 64-bit computing and where can you save power or time by reducing the precision? You know, where is that a realistic conversation and should we be looking at our models, at our codes for where to reduce the precision profitably? Yeah, I mean, there's been many, many papers written about it. Um, it's just, you know, if you walk into uh, the proverbial chemist or physicist's office and you say to them, um, I got a really exciting computer science project for you. I want you to take your solver out of your code that you know already works in 64-bit and go and mess around with a whole bunch of precision and write some computer science journal paper about it You know, two years later. Their answer is probably going to be no, because it doesn't get them tenure. It doesn't advance them in their career. And so there's a burden there on the computer science community to help them, because otherwise the inertia will just make it essentially a meaningless discussion. All right, I like it. Nick, thank you very much for joining us. I need this volunteer, and then we'll have time for one more after that. So if you're thinking you're interested, now's the time to, to be able to step up. We'll get one, this one and then one more. Please come up, introduce yourself, and disagree. Uh, I'm Janusz Kis, uh, pleased to be here. I'm sorry for being uh, unpolitically correct or politically incorrect. 
so I'm kind of wearing two hats. I did my PhD and then later my postdoc in computational chemistry. And now I'm a sysadmin. So I know both sides of the coin, so to say. And as a sysadmin, all what we care about now is the flops. And excuse my language, but as a scientist, I don't give a flop about a flop. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, excuse me for disagreeing, but so as a scientist, what we care about is the complete time to solution. So uh, I, I mean, again, sorry for, for being like incorrect, but Python is here and it will stay. And especially for the future when it comes to like hyperscalers, containers will be a big thing in the future, especially if it was mentioned for portability and for coding. Uh, I know from my children of my sister, they are just literally lazy to push, if I need to, to push two buttons on my mobile phone, how can you make it push a single button? <laughs> so if you try to, you know, attract new talent into field of HPC, uh, if, if, you know, I, I was trained in Fortran MPI, if I would be a young person now, I would be just running away for the hills and I would just do, you know, something which is easier to do. And to your mm. comment, when it comes to like hiring new talent, uh, in, in the previous institute, you know, we often dealt with it that the, the really talented people, they just get a better offer from Google, Intel, and so forth. The, imp the draw of hyperscale away from our industry is actually one of the big challenges. Please talk a little closer to your microphone. So we, and then was it Janos? I did. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm Janos. Right. Thank you. I did, you weren't very close to the microphone. Michelle, did you want to respond to that? He was speaking to you directly. Uh, <laughs> well, no, so I think actually there's a contradiction between, um, unless you take development time into account, there's a contradiction between we want to get the answer as fast as possible and using Python. Uh, especially if you run things more than once, but that's that's by the by. Um, I I think it's a slightly sad state of affair to say young people want to do things as simply as possible. When I mean, we hire lots of young people, and they are not people that want to earn a huge amount of money because they come to work for us at the university. A lot of them love doing Fortran and MPI. In fact, I just put somebody on a new project and they said, "Oh, thank God, I can do Fortran again." He's like 24. You know, I mean, not all young people are the same and not everybody wants to yes. work for Google and not everybody wants to earn the big bucks. I mean, it's some people just want to work in this, in this space because they're idealists and like working in different things in the university and just make a difference. Not, you know, I mean. And right. HPC does solve some of those grand challenges. Sebastian, you just picked up your microphone. Yeah, uh, this reminds me once I've been highly controversial in a meeting, John was there. I, was not, I will not give any detail, John. But uh, I once said, yeah, if you write a simulation, I was into simulations, if you want to write a simulation, basically you want to spend maybe no more than 30% of your time writing the simulation, then you can probably spend like a third of your time running the simulations, and then you want to spend a good amount of your time learning things out of the stuff you get out of your simulator. And I was controversial because we were talking of another simulator, which basically was 99% of writing the simulator, point, perhaps 0.5% of installing the simulator itself, which is, was like a week-long task, a and then somehow trying to make it work. And, and then you had it work, and you have hooray, and where are my results? And that you don't even understand because it's just a big black box that is so, so, so complicated. And there was no, no solution. There was no time for solution at the end because there was no solution. So, <laughs> so, so I think we, can, we should think about it. If, if it makes my people faster at coding, it's good because then they can spend more time interest, like visualizing the results, think about the results. And we should not forget, like, Programming is not like a hobby. It should not be a hobby like uh, solving a Rubik's Cube or, or a Sudoku because it's interesting to do Fortran. Uh, the interesting thing is what you get out of the codes. Uh, that would be my... I think it's not like Fortran's hard. It's not. No, I'm not really saying it's, it's hard, but even if it's like, I don't know, my, my wife is a lot into knitting, and maybe like, I Mine don't know, too. Fortran is nice, and, and, and you like to knit your nice Fortran programs, and it's, but I, at the end, I think the goal is to get yeah, value out of the programming. So I, I pretty much agree. Exactly. Right, Janos, respond to that, then so, I have a new topic. Yeah, I mean, uh, following up on, on Sebastian's comment, 
uh, when we have some new, you know, talent joining and we tell them how about Fortran, the question is like, what Fortran? It's, I, I've, Okay, I've we're talking about the future of HPC and AI ostensibly in this panel. One topic we haven't touched yet is quantum computing. This is a difficult one, so just, you know, <laughs> Uh, how did I write this question? Uh, what are we going to be saying? What is a realistic outlook for com quantum computing by the end of this decade? What are we going to be saying about quantum at ISC 30? Uh, I think we're going to have a better understanding of what, what won't work with quantum computing. I think at the moment we're, we're approaching peak hype. Um, every, I mean, I get asked every half hour whether I'm going to buy a quantum computer. I have no money, so. No, but uh, even if I had, I, I, I have no idea. Um, quantum is way over my head. But I think we'll be at a point where it's actually much clearer how we can use quantum computing as an accelerator, what sort of problems we can solve. And if we're at that point, that'd be great. Go ahead, Janos. Uh, if I may add to that, uh, so just circling back a bit to the data. So I think, uh, I, I'm not saying that quantum computing is a bad thing. It might be a great thing in the future. But first, we should be worried about even like, you know, uh, being able to transfer our currently existing data and interpreting what we have now without, you know, pushing towards the quantum nature. And as a sysadmin, as an example, you know, instead of having these high-end dreams, uh, it would be easier for the user, again, going to the time to solution, that we have users who ask us to download standard data sets, which should be on every HPC cluster on NVMe fast storage, like Lumi does it, you know, reference data set as service. So as a scientist, I don't need to spend two weeks to, to download, you know, a, a machine learning standard data set. And then when a sysadmin, I go through some, some directories, I realize that 100 users downloaded the same data set because they need it and each waited for it. So uh, my point is that instead of pushing towards quantum computing so strong, we should first, you know, solve currently existing problems. Michelle, I have no idea why you were shy about getting up here, because that was a lot of fun. Please step down off the stage. We can take one more volunteer <laughs> up while uh, Sebastian tells me what he thinks about quantum uh, computing. Feel free to boot me up as well, and mm -hmm. I give them the possibility for No, no, you're else. staying. <laughs> well, if no one comes up, I'm taking Michelle back. <laughs> John, go on. All right, quantum computing. So yeah, I've, I've been telling this to a couple of people. Um, as long as the Bitcoin is worth something, I'm not worrying about quantum computing. <laughs> <laughs> John, introduce yourself um, and disagree with something. All right, I'm John Shelf. I'm department head for computer science and general chair of ISC this year. So. And this panel's your fault. <laughs> so it's just yeah, as so well and, that you're up I, here. I, I guess I, I, I get to pay for it now. Okay, uh, so quantum computing, uh, uh, I, I don't, the, the thing that drives me nuts about quantum is that people talk about it like it's a replacement technology. I'm all for uh, quantum computing, expanding computing into an area where digital computing isn't that great, uh, combinatorially complex problems, but to talk about it as if it's going to replace and subsume uh, uh, digital computing as we know it today is a, just a terrible uh, a terrible conversation. We, we shouldn't be talking about quantum that way. All right, we have only a few minutes left, and at the end, I wanted to zero in on the, the uh, slogan for ISC 23 this year was Imagine Tomorrow, <laughs> which is actually perfect for this topic. And the, the aspect of that I want to think about is, you know, we get so focused on the technology. I loved the point that got made about, this is about what you can do with it, right? I think a supercomputer without an application on it is just a very expensive space heater, mm -hmm. all right? So what you can do with it is really what I care about. And as we talk about Imagine Tomorrow, let's think about new applications or new capabilities that we don't have today. If we start looking maybe 10 years out, get to ISC 33, what do you think we're going to be able to talk about an application perspective that's new, that you're excited about? Like some new capability that's coming to us 
10 years out that we're going to get to celebrate at this conference. Go ahead, Janos. Uh, so how I see it as a sysadmin now uh, is that most likely, so not far future, I'm talking about like five to 10 years, will be most likely a kind of hybrid computing where I will have somewhere a quantum computer with let's say up to 1,000 to 5,000 uh, qubits. Mm -hmm. And then I will probably use it as an accelerator in air quotes where I offload the quantum part of my code into that. But first of course we need to really be able to digitally transfer it over. And then we transfer it back again to traditional HPC computing. This is how I see it within the next 10 years, let's, well, let's say. Well, okay, so I don't disagree with that, but it's not quite what I meant, right? You kind of went with the architecture. I'm talking about on the, app, the, the grand application space, what problem can we solve uh, 10 years from now that we can't solve today? Gravitational waves, quantum chromodynamics, this is what mainly relies on quantum nature John of the John snapped his fingers because that's what he wanted to say. Oh, I love, yeah, I love gravitational waves. They're awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, I, I think that uh, uh, really complex systems uh, are, are where we're going. We already uh, uh, see certainly in the NNSA labs uh, very complex codes that are multi-physics, uh, multi-scale, but uh, to imagine like climate modeling today, you know, first it was the die core, but then they add uh, aerosols, things like that. Something that the climate modelers have been talking about is that actually the economic feedback of the price of gas or the reaction to events caused by climate are actually a very large and unexplored effect, feedback potentially into the climate model. And so the notion that you could take it to the next level by actually bringing in economic feedback. I'm also very interested in designing the replacement for CMOS. This whole idea of going from atoms to architectures, that's like the ultimate multi-scale model. And uh, right now we can only do like pinpoint solutions, you know, I can do material science, but I can't quite bring it up to the device scale. I can do devices, but I can't bring it up to the architecture. That being able to span all those scales and bring that together is a very exciting potential future. I like that, and I'll amplify that, kick in something myself before I go to Sebastian to, to the end, but I liked what you said about multi-physics. I think this is one of the great uh, areas in which AI can amplify HPC. We've been talking about person in the loop simulations for my entire career in HPC, and it's always been the person latency is too high, mm -hmm. but we might be able to get AI in the loop, mm -hmm. right? If we can teach AI the rules of a game like poker or go, we can teach it the rules of a game like optimize this airplane wing, mm -hmm. right? And, and you still need your structural engineer to guide it, but to get those ideas. I'm also personally excited about the idea of brain simulation. You know, like a whole human brain simulation, I think I might see by the end of my career. And what that could do for brain research going forward, I think would just be huge. How about you, Sebastian? What are you looking forward to? I think, I think the, the, the very important thing is gonna be AI, this big model. So, so I, what I think, I hope in 10 years, is we're going to get a way to train ChatGPT, like GPT-4, for a fraction of the energy it's consuming right now. And if, it, if we can do that, then potentially we may have the students having, in a, that, would, that would be a dream, but you do a lecture, and during the lecture you kind of train your own GPT billion parameters thing for a specific problem. And, and I think that, that's already starting. My, my colleague, I mean, it's going so fast. The student, they learn very quickly how to work with ChatGPT. Everything they do now is, uh, I mean, they really ask ChatGPT about everything. Mm -hmm. And I think like they would like to be that personalized, so they will probably post train, and, and this will consume more and more and more. Uh, and I think that's going to be a big business in, in 10 years. Yeah, I, I, I want to amplify that, um, that, uh, you know, I. AI for science up to this point has been mostly recognizing a pattern or anomaly detection or you know uh, uh, basically data analysis. But this thing with the large language models, uh, I don't think we've even scratched the surface of what could be done for science with these large language models if we could make them not not be uh, uh, get rid of the mendacity when they don't actually know the answer. I'll, I'll tell you <laughs> what, as we imagine tomorrow, I stay 
I remain excited. I love this industry. I can't wait to come back to ISC 24 and ISC 34 and see what we're talking about mm -hmm. next. John, thank you for asking me to moderate this panel. Please thank my panelists, Dan, Estella, Samir, Didim, uh, Mark, Fabrizio, Nick, Michelle, Sebastian, Janos, and John. Thank you for coming. <laughs>